Hi everyone, this is Takatoshi Shibayama, the host of the Future Design Podcast. This podcast looks to empower listeners with perspectives on how we can challenge the social norm and evolve with better understanding of philosophy, spirituality, and ethics. Empowered individuals can have much stronger voice and influence in bringing about revolutionary changes in the world, whether you're building businesses or technologies. My guests and I speak about social constructs that are commonly accepted in the world today that's not working anymore. And how to rebuild them with ethical values to create a better future. In this episode, I welcome back Jim Noscara from episode 24, Reflections on Freedom, who is a financial expert and VP of Alliance Advisors. He talks to us about the nihilism that is permeating, especially in Western societies today. We get into riveting discussions about secularism and religion in modern history, started the nihilism that has spread out through politics, law, science, and even technology today. Of course, we dive in deeper on how we can move forward to mitigate the worsening of this sentiment by what decentralization can offer. This was one of the best conversations I had about modern society's conditions. So, without further ado, here is my conversation with Jim Muscara. Future Design Podcast. Well, thank you for being back on our show, Jim. It's been almost a year. I was just looking at our past recordings. It was August 12th that our first. Uh, recording came back on. It was episode 24 of Reflections on Freedom. So, a lot of the th- world has changed, and this topic that we're going to be talking about is the nihilism in our society today, is something that I really wanted to pick up on because it was very uh, permeating through society when we were talking about, you know, on freedom, about your book, and et cetera. But I think it's kind of gotten out of hand, in my view, especially in the financial side of things. So, before we just Dig down right into that. For the listeners who might be just tuning in for the first time or haven't heard you spoke speak before,、uh, could you tell us who、uh, Jim Mosquera is, please? Yeah, my name is Jim Mosquera. I'm a resident of a town called St. Charles, Missouri. It's、uh, just right outside St. Louis, Missouri.、Uh, originally born in Panama City, Panama. Yes, that、uh, country with the canal、uh, that has the S shape. And、uh, immigrated to the United States many years ago.、Um, and, and most of my life you know, has been spent in the United States.、Uh, but my first language, I, I can claim, was, you know, was actually Spanish and not English.、Um, my、uh, educational background is in industrial engineering. I have a couple of degrees there.、Uh, professionally, I went into、uh, telecommunications and technology.、Uh, in parallel to that, I had a really keen interest in the financial markets. So, I began trading、uh, from my own account in、uh, commodity futures.、Uh, I did、uh, many different types of commodity futures for a few years.、Uh, then I started to、uh, write about、uh, the financial markets. There was a publication called Examiner that existed in the United States, oh, probably、uh, 2008, 2009. And、um, I wrote for them for a while, then started my own newsletter,、uh, wrote my first book in 2010, published in late 2010. I、uh, actually wrote about Bitcoin in that book a little bit.、Uh, and then that proceeded with a, a progression of books、uh, on the、uh, nonfiction side and also the fiction side.、Um, after I left the telecommunications career and technology career, I started、uh, my own consultancy uh, with uh, uh, financial markets and,、um, and, and, and alternative lending.、Uh, within the last、uh, six months to a year, I have、uh, merged my operation in with another company that is more technologically oriented.、Uh, I've started、uh, a platform called、uh, Alliance University, which is again a learning platform, and we can get more into that as well. Cool, cool. And, you know, so let's just dive right into it. So, nihilism is, is a philosophical term, and it's been used not as a language, but as a concept, even t- during the times of ancient Greece.、Uh, Buddha even mentioned about it. There's a lot of, you know, not just philosophy, but in terms of religion based on nihilism as well. So let's start from there. So, in your terms and how we use it in our modern society, where do you think nihilism has started? Well, I, and, and again, I,、uh, just to be clear to your viewers and listeners, I, I'm certainly not a philosopher, but you know, my understanding of nihilism is really based more on the, the disintegration of. of What you would consider traditional morality, in, in, and I'm speaking from Western society since I'm obviously in the United States.、Uh, it would be interesting to, to un- understand 
if there's been a similar disintegration, you know, in, in Eastern society as well. Um, you know, historically, Taka, we've had what I'll call societal anchors, you know, and, and they were morality, uh, the law and, and science. And I think what's happened over the course of time is th those anchors have, uh, have become uh, unmoored, if you will. And some of the discussion that you and I were having, uh, you know, before we started the show had to do with, you know, are, are we are we creating that transition to, you know, greater forms of anarchy? And, you know, when, when you reach those forms of anarchy in the past, you know, it, it lends itself to the presence of, uh, of demagogues. Right. And, and so what's the danger of that happening? And, and I think that's kind of where we are right now. Mm, for sure. And when I talk about the nihilism in Eastern societies, I think about first and foremost in Japan, we had uh, you know a very long history of you know growth in the economy since World War II up until probably towards the late '80s, where you know politics, economy was all uh, you know in 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 unison to in its growth, and everybody was happy; they were making wealth. But when the bubble burst for the real estate bubble then I think the nihilism started to creep in. And because of the, the annihilation of the economy and the annihilation of growth in general and how politics was trying to revive it but couldn't find a way to do it. And I think it also has to do with the demographic changes in the society, how the economics were shaped globally because before that it was pretty much domestic but now japan had to feel that it needed to grow outside of its own domestic market because it was shrinking but the politics wasn't keeping up to it they couldn't open up the society well enough people were not speaking international languages like english well enough to be able to adapt and obviously there's a lot of cultural differences to it but also i think it, what's really important was that politics or the politicians didn't really understand how to to move out of it so the people started to become nihilistic in a way that they started saying that well politics is not going to save us we got to find our own ways and most of the time it was it was just complete uh being you know just disintegrated and and thinking about yeah i i don't really care anymore and and that's kind of like been very sticky in society and we haven't really seen any way to get out of it and i think there's another form of nihilism in, in china as well probably don't don't need to get into too much details of that because you could probably imagine what's going on there but uh, i think in western societies it has kind of creeped into it in a very very different way and i think that's kind of what we want to start looking at yeah so the first part is i guess is the moral part of it the secularism that you know probably in the late 1800s it already started because Europe was becoming secular. It was detaching itself from Christianity. And I think in the U.S. as well, similar things were starting to happen. So let's let's dive into yeah. that. Topic. And, that, and that's a great starting point, Taka. Um, you know, mor morality is probably the first of those anchors. And, you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, what, what role does religion serve in providing that anchor? Um, I'll give you some perspective um, that I've had over the course of the last decade or two. Um, the place where I reside in St. Louis has a pretty heavy presence, or at least historically had a, a heavy presence of Catholicism and Catholic education. And one of the things that's happened uh, within uh, you know, my metropolitan area is that there's been a marked decrease in the number of schools that are you know, delivering a Catholic education, both at the uh, grade school level, middle school level, and then even more recently at the high school level. Um, I, within the course of the last decade or so, in, in this particular part where I live, the, the Archdiocese of St. Louis has seen, you know, a tremendous decrease in the number of, um, of Catholic schools, particularly at the grade school level. And I would say probably within the last, I don't know, two to three years, uh, two of the Catholic schools have actually closed uh, in, in the St. Louis area. Now, some of that you could attribute to economic reasons. Maybe people don't want to pay for that. Maybe the price has gotten. But I would say there's some, you know, some other factors as well. As you know, as people have migrated, you know, away, you know, from uh, from Catholicism, or maybe you know they're not uh, the regular practicing Catholics of old. Um, but I would say that's you know that that's been a, a very observable shift. You know, certainly in the United States. Uh, obviously, the issue with uh, with Catholicism and, and the, the scandal with priests, you know, certainly didn't aid the cause as well. Um, and, and so I, I think that um, 
with that and another interesting phenomenon, though, that I've seen with regards to um, maybe not so much secularism, but maybe the shift in how Americans view religion is the emergence of these mega churches, um, which um, there's one or there's one or two that I've seen in the St. Louis area that, you know, one of the ways that they had to attract people, you know, to to become members of that church uh, was probably outside of what you would consider the religious sphere. So they had, you know, this ministry or that ministry, these different social activities to bring people in. Now, does that dilute uh, Christianity in any way? I, I'm, I'm certainly not, uh, you know, educated enough to, to weigh in on that. But I would say, you know, the, the, the complexion of, um, of what you see today in Christianity is certainly different, you know, than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, Additive to that, I would say, you know, what happened last year, uh, at least certainly in the United States, and, you know, even to some degree into this calendar year, where, you know, people were prohibited from worshiping, right? And so <laughs> you had these kind of these uh, virtual services that were not well attended. And I, I can only imagine that the lockdown, certainly in the United States, did not help, uh, you know, Christianity in any way because it, it separated people, right? Not just physically, but it separated them from the church. Um, so I would say kind of kind of in summary is, is that, you know, that, that one of the the anchors that we have in society, you know, has certainly um, been impacted. Uh, I remember years ago, I read a book uh, that was called Peace, Prosperity and the Coming Holocaust. And, you know, it was a very dramatic book, but it really talked about how uh, society was, again, experiencing that drift. And this is a book that I probably read over 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, he was predicting that uh, as, as man or society embraced more technology, they felt like they were becoming closer to God. They were becoming God themselves, you know. And, you know, in, in his estimation, that was a very, very dangerous, uh, you know, transition for man to make. So I would say that uh, one of the anchors that I mentioned in, in, in the preamble to our discussion uh, that certainly is, has, uh, has been impacted for sure. Mm -hmm. I think that atheism in general if you actually, it's not even a religion, but it's a belief that there is actually no God. And when you actually detach no God, or sorry, God, from what fundamentally it was really designed for, it wasn't about teaching about what God is. It was teaching about morals and ethics. And when you actually replace God with nothing, and, and then it creates no anger to the morals and ethics and I think that's where it really this nihilism starts to come because if you don't believe in God then maybe there is no such thing as moral and ethics to begin with so you could do whatever you want and that's kind of where I feel like it starts that concept of like nothing else matters kind of idea going through politics finance science technology whatever it is and I think that's where we are in this kind of very dangerous and, ground. And, and think about talk of the next that next transition, which is you know um, the, our morality, our religion, you know, form the basis of our legal constructs, right? And those those natural laws in uh, in the United States, you know, Declaration of Independence, those inalienable rights, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <clears throat> and I think what you've seen is you know as you've had a dilution of morality. It is uh, also permeated into, you know, how we view laws and, and civil society. And, you know, certainly uh, over the course of, you know, the last few years, you know, we've had, you know, challenges, I guess, to what were understandings of, you know, what it was. And again, I'm giving you an American perspective, you know, what it is to be an American. You know, what, what does the Constitution mean? You know, what does the Declaration of Independence mean? And um, we've had a, a shift of the pendulum, if you will, where I, I think there's been a couple of things there's been an abandonment i guess of understanding you know uh, of the concept of civics and um sadly <clears throat> i would say uh, i wrote about this in, in in one of my books escaping oz and observers reflections there's one of those man on the street type things except this was a, a man who did uh, some interviews uh on the campus of, of a texas university i don't remember which one in particular but he went around asking people like tell me uh, within the decade, you know, when the Civil War occurred in the United States, or the Revolutionary War, World War II, I mean, different, you know, historical milestones uh, for the nation. And it was stunning uh, how poorly, you know, these co college students answered that question. But when the question arose of like, okay, what show is Snooki on, <laughs> on TV, you know, they all got it right. And, you know, and the observation there is, you know, it, it, it showed, okay, well, you know, and we can get more into this, like, here's, here's the effect of, you know, of, of, of current culture, popular culture now, 
that is kind of supplanted, you know, again, some of those anchors we were talking about before. What does it mean to be an American? You know, what, what actually happened, you know, during the war for independence? You know, what, what were some of the reasons for the Civil War? And, you know, and so when, when, you, when you make those observations, you know, you think about it. it it's like if you're within that cohort of, of kids that were being asked that question by the man on the street, you know, well, are there anchors then um, Jersey Shore, right, as opposed to understanding American history? And, and, and again, that's, that's a disturbing trend. Mm. I think that also the disbandment of kind of like the local communities by this globalization also feeds into that as well because before you had like these neighborhoods where that were tightly bonded whether it be with by religion or by you know certain uh you know business communities that were built around the the in the industries that are built around that neighborhood and you had something that ties together and now because of this changes in how the economical structures of those local communities or even just bigger in the states, in the, in the national level, has changed how people are, are, are living. So I think that that takes away the whole bond of, of human society away from it. And now we're going to this digital age where we're all, not us, not all of us, but definitely there is a concept of saying that maybe we don't have to be you know physically close together as long as you can bond with somebody overseas through digital formats and you can make create connections, that's good enough. But I think fundamentally we do need this proximity, physical proximity amongst each other to actually continue that moral and ethical values that we should have well, as and, human beings. And yeah, because and, we and actually, and, and to kind of you know amplify your point a little bit in terms of that proximity, you know, there have been studies that that, that, that talked about you know what it means to be close to somebody or within that, that proximity, close proximity. And of course, you know, we'll, we can get more into what happened you know with with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the lockdowns and so forth. But, you know, our brains need serotonin, you know, and, you know, we get a lot of hits of dopamine, you know, throughout the course of our day. Social media is a great example of that because, you know, what can I do is, you know, if you see a lot of people today, you know, they're, they're heads down on this and the dopamine is, oh, I just saw a Twitter post. Oh, there's a Facebook post. Oh, here's an Instagram post. That's all dopamine, you know, and, and what's happened is, is that we're continuing to need that stimulation, right, to like, oh, okay. What, what happened now? Oh, okay, what happened now? And that's all dopamine, right? But what you're not getting is serotonin. And it's hard to get serotonin via even this medium that you know we're in right now, this two-dimensional medium. And one of the things that I, I've tried to emphasize to people is like, okay, now that if you feel comfortable you know, being in person again at events, please avail yourself of that because you can't, I mean, where, whereas you can overdose on dopamine, and, and we know, by the way, just another tangent, we know that... Uh, uh, social media designers have said, you know, we want to addict people to our application, right? That, that makes sense because they, they, want that, that's, that's, they want to drive traffic to it. Well, how does the brain respond to that? Because it's a dopamine response, right? It's not serotonin. Well, you can't overdose on serotonin, uh, but we need more of that. So one of the things that's happened, again, kind of uh, furthering the nihilism is our dopamine and serotonin levels are completely out of balance. You know, we're way high in one and way low in the other. So how do we achieve that? Well, you know, and it's hard for some people is we know we need to kind of move away from this a little bit more and more towards those personal interactions, those, uh, you know, those close community interactions you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And then because we don't have that, we start to forget about that other people have rights or feelings as well. Right. Because because there is a screen in between yourselves, there's a digital space between ourselves that you don't you forget that there's proximity, meaning that maybe if you hurt the other person, it doesn't matter because you switch off your application. You're not going to talk to them anymore. So who cares? So I think that. You know, if you don't have that fundamental kind of moral ethics, whether it be by religion or spirituality or whatever it is that you, anchors you to that, then you're just a, you know, a two dimensional person that has no feelings. I mean, it's totally OK to do that because you just shut it off. You know, I kind of remember back in the days, it's completely off topic, but back in the 90s in Japan, we had these Tamagotchis and uh, you were supposed to grow them into a. A, a character that, you know, start from a baby and grows into a, a full 
size adult i guess and then but if it doesn't work you just hit the reset button to do it all over again right and i feel like that's kind of what, what's actually happening to us is that we create these digital relationships but you know if it doesn't go well you don't have to speak to them anymore because they're not your neighbors right so then i think that thins out the whole morale part of things and that creates more nihilism as well because then you know all your relationships that you're based upon is just fluff right? It's just digital. It's, it's really nothing. So I think that goes into all the other things that you were mentioning about, let's say law. So if you don't have human rights, then what is this law even talking about is that we should have this and this kind of. Yeah. So sorry about that, everybody. It, it, Jim's smoke detector went on. Obviously, it was, his wife was cooking bacon. So let's now, just now, give it. Now the, now the whole world knows that we don't know how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. All right. Cool. So yeah, back to the Tamagotchi thing. And, uh, so we can re reset the, the reset button, but the thing is, yeah, you, we can't reset people's rights. We can't reset all these things because there's no reset button for us human beings. Right. And I think that's kind of one thing that we're losing the anchor to is fundamentally because of this kind of technological advancement of how we interact with each other has created all this nihilism as well. And we can go into all this, you know, problematic uh, systems of social media and et cetera, but let's just kind of keep it around this kind of, uh, you know, proximity kind of conversation where, you know, we have to think about the law. We don't believe in, in people's rights anymore. And we don't believe that the fundamentals of creating those laws to begin with uh, goes into the, to the whole fundamental idea that people do have rights right and i think that's that's kind of like what, what i wanted to talk about which can stem to so many other things uh that we're going to be talking about so let, let, let's talk a little bit about rights and and uh, we'll get into the always uh, colorful world of politics um what i've seen and and again i, I, I would love to know your perspective you know obviously from the east um in this nation, you know, certainly over the last 20 years, and I've made these observations in my books as well, you know, we don't, we don't view people as individuals as much anymore, right? We view them in terms of categories. And that has greatly seeped into our politics. So when you were talking earlier about human rights, individual rights, um, we don't, you know, when, when we report things in the United States, you know, normally you'll see something that there'll be association with some category, either a racial category, you know, a political category, maybe a professional category. Um, and so what, what happens is, is that people then don't identify so much as an individual as they do with some category and over the course of time, it's become more, you know, protected categories, protected classes, and so forth. And, you know, I, I've often wondered that, you know, that's something that, what, to me, what that does, it divides further, right? You know, you, when you create these categories, it's like, okay, I'm not, I'm not associating, associating Takatoshi Shibayama with uh, the individual. He's part of the, oh, this political party in Japan or Singapore or what have you. And the same way, like when things get reported in the United States, uh, it's this person who's a police officer that's this race shot somebody, <laughs> a victim who's of another race, right? And it's always categorized that way. Not so much in, from the standpoint of, you know, there was the tragedy of someone dying, right? Sometimes the police officer and sometimes, you know, the, the victim or assailant, but it's more the class of person that was associated with that. Uh, likewise, in our politics, um, this is something that certainly came to the fore in 2020 and even 2021 in the United States that had to do with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and how you were approaching it and whether you wanted to question the narrative. If you did question the narrative, then you must be of this political class. If you didn't question the narrative, then you must be of this political class. Well, what about somebody like me who I don't identify with either political class, right? And if I question something, well, then I automatically got put into that bucket. Well, but sorry, that's that's not you know that's not my bucket. And uh, unfortunately, everything that's happened you know over the course, uh, certainly the last quarter century, of the United States, and even even beyond that, you know, before that, has been this move towards you know, the centralization where. And usually it's some central authority government, uh, in some cases maybe sees uh, supranational organizations or, or non-governmental organizations that are very large, 
that seek to classify people, make decisions for them, remove that critical thinking ability from people, right? And if you, if you do have somebody that is conducting some sort of critical analysis of the narrative, then they must be a, quote, conspiracy, et cetera, right? Well, ironically, in the 1960s, I think, is when that whole term conspiracy theorist came out. And it was used um, by, in the United States, by the government to brand usually people in the press that were questioning the narrative of, you know, whatever was going on in the 1960s. Well, ironically, now it's been completely flipped. Now it's actually the press that call people, right, conspiracy theorists if there's some questioning of some narrative, right? So think about that. that. That's gone completely turned around. And we can get into a little bit more about uh, the anchor that, you know, people had before, which was the press. Right. And I think we've lost that as well. Mm. I think fundamentally, I think if what I kind of observe about the U.S. in general and probably more specifically U.S. is that you have this concept of right and left or blue or red or good or evil and i think it polarizes people because you have this i this kind of two two system not just on the political side but even you know as a grow as a kid grow up in the us you have to think about things that who are good and these people are supposed to be evil you know i i, I take an anecdote from a uh you know my kids like cartoons that that uh, or even mine but interesting my older son made made an observation and he was saying that my younger son was saying watching a a, a cartoon and he was saying well who you know these two uh, characters are going against each other who's bad and who's evil and my older son was saying well you know th th there is no good or bad in these in this cartoon it's like everybody's just fighting but it doesn't mean that you know one side is good and one side is evil and i think that we, it's very easy to create a society and say this group of people is good and this people a uh, group of people is evil because there's no such thing you know i think everybody has some kind of right to say that this is the way i think and this is my problems and i want to solve these in a certain way even though the other you know part you know group of people think differently but there's no such thing as good or good or bad but i think that you know creating this good and bad kind of polar concept is creating the whole fundamental reason why people want to categorize each other and say these guys are bad these are good because that's the only way that you can actually think of how people think. yeah and and you know the the the, the categorization i want to i want to specify that a little bit a little more granularity is that humans are attracted to tribes Right. That, that's a that's a natural, you know, evolutionary uh, uh, construct. Um, you know, it, it was said that during the uh, the bombings uh, of London in World War Two, that people felt that tribal cohesion of hiding in the tube. Right. While the, the Nazis were bombing overhead. And and you and I actually wrote about those things as well. in one of my escaping Oz books that when when uh, people that were serving overseas and in in, in, uh, in conflicts they come back to the united states they miss that tribalism right they miss that tribalism of being with their squad um i can tell you from you know from playing a lot of competitive team sports that you know and, and you hear this from from people that are in professional sports that you know like okay what do you miss you know after you leave the game or you retire do you miss the game itself a lot of times you say no no, no i just miss hanging around with the guys or the girls or what have you right it's that tribalism but here's the difference, Taka. I think that, you know, those tribes are, you know, tend to be kind of smaller units, right? But instead, what we're experiencing today is those, it's not the, the small unit, maybe at a community level, family level, team level, as I was using that as an example. It's at a much broader level, right? It's at a national level here in the United States, whereas you mentioned, you know, you're blue or red, right? <laughs> Republican or Democrat. You know, vaxxer, anti-vaxxer, you're conspiracy theorist or you're non-conspiracy theorist. And that's a very, very dangerous classification, right? Because then, you know, if, you, if you're a person that's like, what if I'm not in either one of those, you know, what do I do? I'm, I'm almost forced to pick a side, right? And um, I, I, that's, that's not a healthy thing, <laughs> right? And it, and it gets away from those individual rights that we were talking about earlier. Mm, yeah, for sure, for sure. But, uh, you know, what I wanted to kind of drive at more was that, you know, if you want to think that your side is good and the other side is bad and you find out that nobody's actually good or nobody's actually evil, at the same time, you find that, okay, so what I'm saying is not really good and neither is the other side. 
then what is actually the truth? Uh, or what is actually supposed to be right? Is there some, you know, superior idea out there that I'm missing out on? And I think that's kind of when people start to get lost. You know, you're fighting so much against yourselves and you find out in the end, yeah, you guys have, you know, maybe you haven't got to this point yet, but you will find out that, yeah, you, you have a point. Yeah, our side has a point, but there's no, 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 no right to any of these things. Then wh what am I going to anchor my beliefs on now? So that then and that creates this kind of nihilism too. I I feel like because if there's no ultimate right, if there's no you know superior right rightness, I guess in that sense, then then the whole world means nothing, right? And that that's the dangerous um, direction that people can really get into. And I feel that it it has happened a little bit in Japan as well because you know we all believe that the government is actually right. It was always doing the right. Thing and all of a sudden it just fell out and there's nobody else to take its place and we have no idea where we're going to. So then, then people say, well, then I don't really care about politics. The voting right in Japan is is you know embarrassingly low. It's around always around like somewhere between twenty to forty percent. If you know forty percent is like it's at, at its best, right? Nobody really wants to participate. So. I, I fear that, you know, the, the more of these concepts of like not really believing that there is a, how, how should I put it, the, the, because, you know, you don't see that there's no such, such thing as superior, you just lose the anchor and they just fall deeper, deeper and deeper into this nihilism. Well, so let, let's examine that. Um, we talked about, you know, maybe what the sources of truth were for society historically, right? Maybe they were religion, maybe they were law. Uh, certainly they should be science, right, in, in many respects, but we, we've also lost the ability to look at what I call gray areas, you know, or areas that, you know, require deliberation and debate. And, you know, and, and sometimes when you hear the word science of where, you know, this science is settled, well, I would argue that, you know, science oftentimes is not settled, right? I mean, for the longest period of time, science, the settled science said that the Earth was at the center of our right of our solar system, right? It was a geocentric view as opposed to a heliocentric view. Uh, settled science also said that you know if Christopher Columbus kept sailing right in that direction, he would fall off, right? Um, and we have some debates going on in the scientific world right now that again merit that continued debate. They're they're portrayed as settled science, but in my estimation, you know, you have uh, competing groups of thought maybe on, on different things in, in the scientific realm, right? We experienced something like that worldwide last year with SARS-CoV-2, certainly did in, in this country, and I, and I can certainly relate some instances of that. So, the, the, so if we don't have the sources of absolute truth, then how do we have um, intelligent, you know, cogent debates on those gray areas or those things that are more nuanced? And it becomes difficult to do that, again, when we get back to that separation that I talked about earlier, right? Where you're, you're in this camp or that camp. Well, what about the middle camp? And, you know, one of the things I think that's really, really important for people, and again, this is very difficult nowadays because, you know, we have the distraction of these devices, is that people need to really go out and learn and do a lot of their own research. And even though uh, the internet gets bashed for, well, you know, there's a lot of inaccurate information there, there's also a lot of accurate information on the internet if you do your homework. And I can tell you that um, I knew very little about epidemiology before March of 2020, even February of 2020. And then I dove into it and started to learn a lot more. So I was able to kind of, again, create that gray area, that, that nuance that I wasn't getting, you know, either from science or certainly the press in the United States or the government narrative or the World Health Organization or what have you, right? There was something there that needed to be pulled out, but I, I could only do that through my own accord. Um, it's very, very important for people to educate themselves, to find sources, again, of, of either truth or having them uh, have the capacity to then discover more of that truth. Um, th those are things that are missing, uh, I would say. So you either, uh, if, you, if you don't have that anchor, right, which again, for some people that anchor's gone, whether that's, you know, whether that's law or religion, um, then have the mental capacity to try to discover those nuances in some of the, uh, some of the public discourse that's going on today. Um, I remember years ago, the 43rd president of the United States stood before, I don't know if it was the United Nations or Congress, and he said, you're either with us or against us. 
Well, what if I'm in neither one of those camps, right? I mean, this is much more nuanced than that. And then it comes out later that, you know, well, you know, his, his, his assumptions on what he was saying were incorrect, you know, based on either intelligence failure that was negligent or willful, however you want to, you know, classify it. Yeah, I think the whole concept of middle ground is always going to be around uh, whether you really want to scientifically prove it or not. Because even, you know, as you mentioned, science is still premature. We're still dif- discovering things about, a lot about you know, things around this world, we even discovered that gravity has, has a uh, waves to it. And, and we actually, you know, found it and before it was all theoretical. So I think that, you know, right now, if we're trying to base our belief on scientific fact, we miss out on a lot of things. And this is what I've been talking quite a lot on my in terror series, which talks about more of the spiritual side of things is that, that, you know, what our understanding of this world right now is based on logic and science. But, you know, it, there's so much mysticism in this world right now, whether it be, you know, I had a topic on, let's say, like psychedelics and what you can see through, you know, using these uh, psychedelic drugs or even, you know, people coming from a different, uh, I would say, spirituality background where they believe in reincarnations that our souls are part of this, you know, cosmic universe and, you know, we're, our physical bodies are just vessels. None of this is actually proven by human science, but maybe it can be in the future who knows right but we don't know this thing yet and uh we had a recent episode on on uh, you know longevity how do we you know use genetic coding to prolong our lives and that the assumption for prolonging our lives is that aging is is a disease and we're not supposed to actually physically die and 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 to me like a lot of these things can come from so many different ways it's not just about putting ourselves into like which bucket what category is that you know everything's all mushed up together but we still need to anchor ourselves in something in order for us to move forward and we can't live in this kind of like bipolar world where we have to decide you know who goes into what what Otherwise, you know, you do fall into this nihilism. And uh, you talked about technology as well. So technology is coming into a world very rapidly now. And we're now basing our true beliefs in technology, but it also has its down pitfalls and, and downsides as well. You know, I, I briefly mentioned about social media. If you believe everything that's on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is or Twitter, you know, obviously that's not really the truth because it's created by human beings and they can, you know, put in propaganda and false misleading information out there. So we can't base everything on technology. But now we have this whole concept of crypto, which I also love to talk about uh, with you, is that in this whole world of crypto now is that everything has to be coded. Everything has to be open source. You can see it and you can examine it to make sure that if you're lending in certain cryptos onto the market, it's always going to be guaranteed 150 percent collateral you know all these things everybody's looking for hard evidence to make sure that whatever our ambiguity uh, that we have in human society which are very biased needs to be on technology so that everybody can see it and confirm and verify that it's true and do you think that that is the way forward yeah so lots to unpack there <laughs> let, let's let's take a step back and, and, and break that down to a couple different parts let's let's start with technology um when when we've lost our anchors, you know, we talked about earlier whether they're uh, you know religious, legal, law, um, and, and you know that community building and so forth. You know, so people have turned to technology. What has been the biggest impact, you know, on um, on this move towards nihilism? Again, my interpretation. Uh, we we talked earlier about these devices. Well, what what is it that's that's attracting people to, to these devices? It's primarily social media, right? I mean, those are the things that you know they get a lot of the traffic. Um, Social media, the, the, the issue that I see there is that we have placed the social media companies in a really tight spot, right? When, when Facebook was first created or Twitter and so forth, you know, if you'd have told them that, okay, X number of years into your future, you're going to have to play the role of journalist, right? You're going to have to play the role of fact checker. They would have said, no, no, we're, that, that's not our business model. And guess what? It's not their business model. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not in their comfort zone. But they're doing these things because, at least in the United States and maybe other jurisdictions, they fear that uh, some federal authority is going to say, you need to do these things, right? Or in the United States, you're going to lose this special legal exemption that they have, you know, where they're not responsible for what other people say on their platform, right? And unfortunately, what that's done, it's, it's placed, you know, uh, the, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world in the position of playing, you know, again, fact checker, journalists and so forth. 
which is not their it's not their sweet spot. It's not their core competency, right? And unfortunately, what that's done is then now we have this rise of censorship, right? Whereas you know these platforms used to be free mediums of expression, whether you believed it or not. Again, to me, it's irrelevant. We're getting back to those individual rights, right? If if I don't have, and, and again, these are private platforms, so yes, legally they can do whatever they want, but that wasn't their original intent. Their original intent was, hey, at Facebook, I can post a silly picture of myself doing you know whatever, holding this sign um, that may be offensive to some, right? But I had that individual right to be able to do that. Now what's happened is, no, you don't. Uh, we're going to divide, right? So you're either in this bucket or that bucket. And in the United States, I think it's been demonstrable that you know, the social media outlets have been, you know, uh, exercising more censorship <laughs> in one of the camps than they have in the other. Um, over the course of this last year, you know, we experienced a little bit more of that because we had the same thing happen with SARS-CoV-2, whether, you know, if you post something on Facebook or Twitter that maybe went against, again, the, uh, the current narrative or the dogma, well then, okay, you got censored or you got pulled out, you went in Facebook jail, whatever it has. Um, I feel kind of bad that I've never actually been, been in Facebook or Twitter jail, and I'm thinking, you know, m maybe maybe what I don't write, and this this is I guess a criticism of me is like I, maybe what I don't write is controversial enough because I mean I try to stay you know very balanced, you know, get you know kind of be very inclusive of other thoughts, but at the same time you know help develop those those narratives that may be different you know than than conventional narratives. Um, but we have really really created a, a really bad situation you know with social media in that. You know, now it's it's almost like, and not that it was a news source before, but people uh, invariably over the course of the last few years have used social media as sources of truth, right? Which is not what you should be doing anyway, right? And and so it's forced the social media. Oh well, gosh, if we're a source of truth, then we better start acting like journalists. Well, you're not journalists, right? You're social media companies, you know. And, and, and that's a very, very unfortunate shift that has again, created more of that division uh, and, and, again, remove that individuality that we were talking about earlier. Now, I think the potential salvation for that longer term is the, the emergence of uh, decentralized technologies, like you know, I'm sure we're going to get into here shortly, where you know, um, I don't have to worry about uh, something that I wrote in this social media post, you know, being removed, censored, you know, me being kicked off and so forth, right? Um, in, in my estimation, uh, the platforms of Twitter and Facebook are probably technologically speaking, easily replaceable. Now you have a path dependence because there's so many users on those platforms already, it's hard to move them off. But replicating those platforms, I mean, from what I can tell, would not necessarily be technologically hard, right? So if you had platforms, and some, you know, emerged here in the course of the last couple of years, were like, hey, come to this platform, it's very Twitter-like, right? Come to this platform, it's very Facebook-like, and you won't be censored, right? Uh, you won't be kicked off. Uh, and maybe some of those use blockchain technologies where it's immutable records and so forth. Um, the problem with some of that is is now some of those associations with these alternative social media channels is oh well they must be you know ultra conservative right wing <laughs> so, so it's like so it's almost like you can't even win there either now because it's like okay those that that group has migrated to that platform and because you know they've been censored on you know on the more traditional platforms um, but. Uh, again, it's 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 unfortunate. Um, I, I think it's driving more of that nihilism because then you know, like, okay, I, I I used to use Facebook as a news source or you know for source of truth, and now I can't even rely on that anymore. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I got kicked off of YouTube once because I made some comments on the uh, COVID vaccine, and I just and I was told that because I mentioned something about COVID that was not along their community guidelines, my video got, uh, you know, removed. So I am a victim of all these things. But I think the most important thing is not about me talking about having the right to say whatever I want about the COVID vaccine. It's more about the fundamental uh, uh, revenue model that these social media platforms are built upon is the advertising, right? So if you want to sell ads, Show them people what people want to see so that you can sell more ads on top of it because the more time they're engaged in this social media platform, then you can 
send more and more and more ads to these people so they'll buy something in the end right so the i think the whole concept of like selling ads created this whole thing because in the beginning uh if you talk about facebook it was only a platform to see girls in different schools right <laughs> yeah that was all it was or like myspace was for artists just to to record their music and upload it and share it with people trying to bypass the record labels right which both of them had beautiful oh not beautiful but like you know they had you know their initial concept and they just spiraled out to something because they needed to get you know vc funding and the, and the capitalism kicked in and said well now you have to make you know revenue models of it what is the easiest way for you guys to make money so you can return money to us yeah you sell ads because it's probably the best way to do it so now they're like the biggest ad company in the world and that's how they make money they don't make money because they're infrastructure for journalism it's not an infrastructure for people to post things anymore right that's just a you know a, a platform that people engage in and they, they could they could hook people on it so i think that that solves the whole thing and i'm seeing a lot of browsers coming up with like no ad models you have to pay a monthly fee and be on it so i think there are ideas coming out and in this whole concept of web 3 about decentralizing the platform itself with no central authority creating you know ad, ad models to it because you don't need a revenue model to begin with it should be an infrastructure right just like plumbing is like you know water there's no advertising for water there's no advertising for electricity right so i, I think that's that's where social media platform has has to go to towards because it is an infrastructure now and if you're being censored if you're being cut off from the from the grid you're completely lose your rights to be able to freely express what you want to say or get information whatever it is that you need to do on the internet so uh, i think that you know just moving on to this conversation towards the decentralization of things is that do you find that you know nihilism can be mitigated in some way uh, creating these kind of decentralized platforms where you know that you can trust this system because it's just a software. There's no, you know, intentions of making you do anything and, and trusting it so that, you know, you can freely express and regain your lost rights. Let, let, let's explore that. I, I like, I like the term that you said mitigated and whether nihilism, you know, could be mitigated. Um, let's take a step back to around 2008 or so. Um, there was a you know someone or some entity by the name of you know satoshi nakamoto which wrote a white paper and you know we, we know what happened after that and it, it really was something that i was able to incorporate a uh, little, little little deviation here in my fictional series um that is you know it's a political thriller series it's four books but one of the things i i thought was important there is to explore this concept i didn't you know overtly call it nihilism in the book but you know people that you know don't have any more anchors they don't see any more use for the current you know structures you know authority structures and and so they've made the conscious decision of hey you know what i want to separate myself from all that right to your point mitigating that nihilism there's there's no value over here anymore so i'm going to create my own values separate of that i think satoshi or whoever that is took a major major leap forward you know in that regard what I did in my novel series is I created um, a cyber character and his <clears throat> his or her acolytes that said, hey, you know what? It's great. Um, United States government, you can exist out here. We don't need you for anything. We don't want you for anything. Now, we're not anarchists in that we're not going to say, hey, we're going to we're going to tear down the government. You know, we're going to take over this and that. We're just going to live our life separately over here. We're going to uh, we're going to live in the crypto verse. We're going to live in, in the Internet verse. And moreover, the only thing we need you for, United States government, is to protect us from foreign invaders, right? If you go back to why governments, you know, at, least, at least in the United States, the government was created <clears throat> to protect those rights that we talked about earlier, right? So if, if you are living where I live and you have to worry about marauders, you know, lobbing missiles, you know, where I, I mean, you completely disrupt commerce, you can completely disrupt, you know, the social fabric, all of those things, right? Well, who's in the best position to do that? Well, a central federal government. And, and that's kind of what I fictionalize in my books is like, you know, uh, this, these, these, uh, or these uh, internet characters, these cyber characters, they said, you know what? We're going to separate from all that. We don't need you. We don't care about you. If you want to join us over here, you can. And here's how we're going to operate. And by the way, we use crypto money, right? Just like we do here in, in real life. And, and I think that's created an important distinction where I, this is where I think crypto is sort of heading right now is 
if you think about it, and I, and I heard a critique recently from a very, very famous author about Bitcoin. And, you know, part of it was, well, you know, I can't transact in Bitcoin like I do. And, and yes, all those things are true. But I believe we may be in the very, very early stages of some of the things that I that I kind of foretold in my in my fictional book, which is, again, this separation. I mean, if I've got Bitcoin, Ethereum, and I've got all of these different mediums of exchange, if I've got tokens that use for application, what I what I posited in, in my and this is in my nonfiction book is imagine that you had a certain number of people that removed themselves from the economy in some way and was just operating, let's say, in the cryptoverse or, or this alternate uh, this alternate economy. What happens over here? Can I function over here in this alternate economy? Yes, I can, right? You know, we, we know that we can exchange value over the internet. And, and now, you know, whether it's Bitcoin or, you know, an, another a cryptocurrency, we know that it can operate in a trustless environment. We know that it's immutable, right? Um, what, we, what we haven't established yet, and, and the biggest criticisms I think to Bitcoin is, well, Bitcoin is, you know, very volatile in price and, you know, it was 65,000 here not too long ago and it got down, I think the low was like 28 or 29,000, now it's like 34,000, you know, that a currency can't operate that way. And, and, and while that's true, my, my retort is, well, yeah, because if you compare everything to, you know, the base, uh, the base currency of a U.S. dollar, then yeah, you are going to experience those fluctuations. But if I live in Venezuela, right? and I'm not operating with a Bolivar, right? And let's say my holdings are all in crypto. Have I been impacted by the dollar fluctuation of Bitcoin? Probably not, right? Probably not the same way. And, and I think that's something for Americans and people, you know, and in, in certainly in the G20 countries to consider, like, you know, in other countries, they don't have those same reference points, right? And um, the, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that I, I agree with you, the term that you use. Are we, are we mitigating nihilism by creating this alternate you know, economy, this alter, alternate cryptoverse, you know, this alternate way to, to exchange value? And I believe the answer is yes. Um, what I suspect is going to happen over time, and again, this is kind of the theme of my, my, of my political thriller books, is that you'll see this tension, right? between those that want, you know, the existing authority structures, right, that, you know, are, are promoting more, whether advertently or inadvertently, that nihilism, and those that are seeking that decentralized, right, that more liberty approach. Uh, and, and that's really the clash that I see in the future. You're starting to see some of that now because we're in the early very stages. But what's interesting, though, is you see much more of this mainstream adoption of things that are crypto and blockchain, right? I mean, these aren't, you know, these aren't just names like Jim Mascara and Takatoshi Shibayama that, that are making, you know, taking positions, you know, in cryptos. These are very, very large entities. So I, I think in the future, you know, that, that clash will be perhaps even more convoluted because if you have very, these very, very large institutions that are deeply invested in those things, you know, financially, you know, operationally and so forth, if you say, well, I'm going to remove that, that's going to be really hard to do, right? As more and more time goes on, and as as we also know, you know, politically, those institutions, you know, donate to political campaigns, and it's going to be very hard for a politician to say. So I, I, we are really setting ourselves up for a very, very interesting future. And, and again, this clash, you know, between that authority and the decentralized entities that we're building today. Mm. I mean, I certainly always believe that crypto, it was a democratic voice to say to the governments or the monetary authorities that you're not doing your job right. And and I do not want to have a world where there's no real political system, there's no physical governments and anything like that, because we do have physical bodies. We can't live 100% in a digital metaverse, right? And while we have our bodies in this physical form, we can be, you know, bombed or missiles flying out to us and if we don't actually have a physical government in order to prevent that from happening have a proper military force to protect us then we can't even live in the metaverse to begin with so we can't just yeah, we can't just take our brains out and upload it onto some server somewhere and then completely live off off on the internet so i i still still believe that we should have a proper government in place proper monetary authority in place to make sure our physical lives are well kept up but at the same time you know this nihilism of like not believing there's no such value in terms of money 
also stems from the fact that because of all this zero interest rate policies and money flowing into out of like fixed income products and into real assets, equities, gold, crypto, what, what have you, is that there's a complete detachment from value to actual price. And now it's like everything is about price and it has nothing to do with value anymore. And that's where nihilism, financial nihilism comes from is that. Well, if, the, if value has no meaning to it, equity value has no meaning because now, you know, the, it's completely overpriced and now it's just price action that you want to make money off of. And, and in a way, crypto is too because there's no fundamental value to it. So are we just gaming everything, right? So are we just playing with price? And if there's no price to it, it has no meaning to it, right? And, and if, there, if you could pump up price and make money off of it, that's great. Then it becomes like a complete gamification of the financial markets, and that's another scary part that we're actually entering into as well. I think I think you're right, Taka, in that sense. And what I tell people, um, especially when there's there's predictions about, oh, here's where Bitcoin's ultimate price is going to be. I think if you focus on that, I think you're missing the point, right? Yes, it's great if I bought you know Bitcoin at ten dollars and now it's at fifty thousand dollars, right? Hooray, right? That, that's a really really good thing. Um, but I do think because of the speculative environment that we're in, in all assets, <laughs> right? And not, not just the traditional financial assets like equities and, 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 and fixed income instruments and derivatives and so forth, but we have to throw precious metals into that. Uh, we certainly have to throw crypto into that as well, because uh, ultimately what has bought your crypto assets right now has been a fiat currency that's been created you know, by some central authority and we can argue how much central bank balance sheets have grown. In the United States in particular, um, there's a measure of, of money supply growth called M1 that over the course of the last year has just gone bananas, right? I mean, it has exploded. And that money, uh, it, and sure, a lot of it gets parked as reserves, you know, in the central bank, the Federal Reserve of the United States as bank reserves, but a lot of that money makes it out into, right, the economy in some fashion. Um, it has made its, it made its way primarily into a lot of financial assets, as we know. Um, we know that the, you know, the traditional measures like, okay, well, the United States is experiencing this, in, quote, this inflation. And you know, my point is, yeah, it's more of a transitory effect because one of the things that you absolutely have to have for you know, the, what, what, you would, what people traditionally consider inflation, the velocity of money has to be much, much higher. Well, the velocity of money collapsed last year. I mean, and it's been in a downward trend for a long period of time. So, but you're right. Uh, the danger right now is that you know there's such, to, to quote a famous central banker, such irrational exuberance over many kinds of assets that you know <clears throat> the next move you know potentially in crypto in the crypto sphere is if there's a big crash in, in value again in the value from a fiat perspective again. Well, then people it's like okay, there may be you know even more of a move to nihilism. Well, oh, wow, you know we had expectations for crypto and now it's let me down. And I'm, and I'm like, no, no, that's 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 not the point, right? The point is creating these structures, these decentralized structures in the first place. Whatever the value is compared to some reference uh, fiat currency, um, I think misses the point. And yes, that does have an impact on on people financially. But that's not the ultimate goal. And to your point, if, if we really want to mitigate some form of nihilism that we're experiencing right now, uh, we have to have confidence that these other structures will survive and thrive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I do want to wrap this up in some way because we've gone into so many areas of conversation. So, you know, what do you think is the way forward? So, you know, I, I think in terms of technology, we kind of agreed upon that, you know, some form of decentralization and looking at uh, cryptocurrency as some form or even the metaverse as some form of new way to create value uh, or recreate value in a different way that it's not tied to government, that it's not t tied to monetary authority, but we do still have to deal with the political side of things that we still have to you know face in a day-to-day -day, uh lives and also whether it be the, the moral anchor that we need to be looking for i mean what, what do you think is the way forward um i'm glad you asked this because uh what at the conclusion of my first two nonfiction books i kind of wrote like a prescription for the future and even though i wasn't thinking about it from a, a a nihilistic perspective i thought well how do we move forward right now given some of these things that are occurring uh number one as you mentioned decentralization and, and yeah, we talked about decentralization from the standpoint of, um, of, of exchange of value of cryptocurrency and, and blockchain. 
But the other thing I would tell you is I think we need to decentralize from the standpoint of moving away from having a lot of our decisions made for us by centralized entities. And one of the things that happens is when that centralized entity makes decisions for you, that centralized entity oftentimes has no vested interest in what's going on with you or your community. Geographically, they're a long, especially in the United States, they're a long way away from you. Um, and the way, you know, the way you have to set up that structure, you know, is, you know, the taxation policies, you have to create you know, these bureaucracies and so forth, which in itself breeds its own inefficiency. So Jim's prescription is, Let's move more of the decision making that we experience as individuals closer to a local level, okay? And when you do that, again, you remove a certain layer of bureaucracy. I, I think it'll be more cost efficient to do that. And it allows that, in, that what I'll call that market intelligence to be much, much closer you know, to where that action is. So as an example, um, I know more about you know how I'm going to run my business in St. Louis, Missouri, right? And some of the you know the traffic patterns and you know anything cultural associated with St. Louis the history than a bureaucrat in Washington D.C. And again, that's nothing against the bureaucrat. It's just very very difficult you know for that bureaucrat to have that same knowledge. So we want to extract as much of that market knowledge as possible. But that market knowledge exists you know closer to where it's actually occurring not through a centralized authority that has some grand plan. I mean, we know these things don't work because they were tried in China, they were tried in Russia with you know these very, very long-term economic plans. They didn't work, right? Uh, these countries grew and prospered when what happened, we threw those plans out. But we're, we, <laughs> we've actually been doing the opposite in the United States. We, we, we're centralizing more and more. The federal government is growing larger and larger, and there's a price to pay for that, right? And I don't mean a financial price. There, there, there is a price to pay for that because you lose control. What were we talking about earlier? You're losing that individuality because someone else is making making decisions for you, or imposing rules and regulations on top of you or your community, and and that's it's very very difficult and you to do that. And then you have what I'll call the law of unintended consequences, where like, oh, okay, we've got this plan for you. And then it completely falls apart. Well, because you didn't know A, B, C, and D related to the decision you made, because it was very difficult for you to know that. So prescription number one, if, you, if we want to take anything out of that, is think decentralization, not just so much from a currency uh, perspective or digital ledgers. Think about it just from a governance perspective. Think about you know, moving these decisions closer to where they actually impact the people. Yeah, I 100% agree. I had a chat with uh, one of my good friends who also appeared on one of our ep uh, episodes. And w I was talking about how I could take example like in Japan or you can t take uh, the EU, for example. There are so many wealthier nations, let's say, in the EU that are subsidizing for the poorer countries. And that creates a lot of frustration amongst uh, either both sides, I guess, because the, the wealthier nations, people are paying taxes. They're saying, why do I have to pay for roads and bridges in some other country that has no economic benefit for me? And then and also on the poorer side of things is that they're always giving handies and they're not g giving the right to improve or grow themselves, right? So if I look at Japan as well, you have a centralized government deciding to the budgets for each of these kind of prefectures or states, as you call them in the states. And they will think, okay, well, these guys are not making money See here, so I'm going to take the Tokyo people's money and then allocate it into this poorer state over there. Well, that creates, that actually, uh, I would say it doesn't, make that state particularly mature in the sense of e economic stability because they're always waiting for handies. So if you actually say, this is your problem, this is your responsibility, you figure it out and we're not going to give you any handies. Well, I mean, you, fi you figure it out, but then give them the ability to figure it out, right? Give them the, the individual rights to figure it out. Don't get in their way. Yeah, exactly. So I think the central government's role should be more about refereeing than rather than like being the parent and be doing everything for them, right? And I think, well, maybe the idea of modern parenting is kind of becoming like that as well, is that you have to like do everything for your kids, but actually, no, it's not really true. But I think, you know, you just have to be the referee and say, these are the rules, you follow them, you guys are on your own, figure it out your, uh, for yourselves. And I think that's the way that I, I personally think that, you know, decentralization it doesn't mean that everything has to be decentralized, it's that it's more about breaking it into smaller pieces and giving more authority to people that are closer to home and having them to decide for themselves because they feel left out. And that's kind of what I, I, I think, and I completely in, in line with what you're saying. 
I, I couldn't have said it better than what you just did. <laughs> <Yeah. so. laughs> well, this is a great way to wrap up, Jim. Thank you so much for your time. And maybe like in a year's time, we're going to have another chat about uh, <laughs> <laughs> And maybe your well, wife's well, cooking well, skills may improve by then. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is your host, Takatoshi Shibayama. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. Now, if you enjoyed or disliked the show, please let me know by writing in the comment section. The only way I can improve or add value to you is through your voices. If there are any topics that you would like me to pick up, please also let me know in the comments. I'd love to start chatting with you all. And if you would like to continue watching the show, please subscribe. Thank you.